and welcome to the Write the Book Inside You podcast. Tips, tools, and interviews for coaches and healers like you who want to write a non-fiction book to boost your visibility, clients, and cash flow while making a difference. I'm your host, Carol Westmore, a multi-published author and energy psychology tapping book coach. Now let's jump into today's episode. Michael Laron is the author of over 80 books across science fiction, fantasy, and self-help books for authors, including the two that we are going to focus on today, the Author Estate Handbook and the Author Air Handbook. Today's episode is about facing our mortality, and by sheer coincidence, we are recording this interview the day after the passing of Queen Elizabeth II. Now we know there are many protocols in place for this event, so her heirs, including King Charles III, have advisors about the protocols. But what about you and me as authors? What protocols can we put in place to ensure that the future of our books, videos, and intellectual properties as authorpreneurs continues? And I just had a thought to ask, will companies like Amazon continue to stockpile our royalties because our bank account closes? So welcome, Michael. Hi, Carol. Great to be here. The one thing I really wanted to know is the backstory. Did you, you've been through some physical ill health over the last few years. And was it, was it that that triggered you waking up in the night and thinking about your author legacy? Ironically, no. I have thought about it from time to time, but how I really got into thinking about my my future was I had a grandfather who passed away last year of old age. And he did such a wonderful job of planning for his estate, determining what happened to everything that it got me inspired to think about it for myself. He was he was in his mid 90s. He said that he didn't want to be a burden to the family when he passed away. And when he passed away, he was true to his word. He grew up there in the Great Depression, very frugal, never owned a computer, never had an email account, you know. So in many respects things were were pretty simple for his estate. But when I think about my own estate and my own things that I've got going on in the 21st century, all the mm-hmm. digital accounts and million things that we have going on technologically, I realize that that's a phenomenal challenge and I better get going if I'm going to figure this out. In the last year after he passed, did you come up with the research and, and the books, that, the two books you've written? Yes. yes. And and what did you notice about your own estate situation at the time? Or, and what have you changed? Yeah, my own your... estate situation at the time was admirable, but not good enough. So at the time, I had a will. Mm-hmm. I had a living will. I had, I mean, I talked to an attorney. We had gotten all the paperwork drafted. My wife and I had plans in terms of what would happen if either of us were to die. But what we really didn't plan for was what would happen to my books when I pass away. Mm-hmm. So I, I have a I have a young daughter. So making sure she's taken care of is is a priority in terms of getting life insurance and you know, just taking care of her guardianship if something were to happen to both myself and my wife. We handled that just fine. But it was the books that I didn't understand what would happen to. So in terms of what has changed, what has changed is I actually, I pulled up my will and read it. And I was horrified by what the will did to my books <laughs> because <laughs> it turns out the attorney I mean, had laughing, no clue. Really? No, it, 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 it really, it, 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 it's, it's funny, <laughs> but it's incredibly sad. Because yeah. when a lot of people hire attorneys, th- they hire the attorney and they think the attorney knows everything. It turns out my attorney didn't have a clue. Mm-hmm. And so if I had taken their word, then I wouldn't, ha- I, I, there's no way I would have an estate because of some of the wording that they put in the will. So I had to get a new will. I had to hire a, another attorney and scrutinize their work very carefully. But I also had to figure out how other authors are addressing copyrights in their wills. There's good information out there, but there's not a lot of good information for authors. What a lot of people do is they look at estate planning for regular people. Mm -hmm. And estate planning for regular people is not the same as estate planning for authors because authors have intellectual property. Your average person does not have intellectual property. And intellectual property is different in that 
you own it for your entire lifetime and your family can continue to make money for for your entire lifetime plus 70 years after you die. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when you think about that, that that requires a mindset shift that I, I think is is very difficult to think about long term. Michael, do you think, uh, as I'm listening to you, do you think that publishing company, you know, the traditional publishers had it sort of sorted for people so that they didn't have to worry about it, that their royalties would continue whether their bank accounts were closed or not, that the the heirs would just phone the publisher? Do you think that's been the shift, that there are a lot of indie self-published authors, myself included? Yes and no. I mean, yes, it certainly would be simpler if you were a traditional publisher because all you have to do is write them and tell them where to send the money. But it's not it's it's not so easy if you've got six kids, for example, right? I mean, you still uh, have to figure out how the money is going to be distributed to those six children. So it's not it's it's not as simple as it sounds. But yes, if you were organized and you could you figured out how that money is, gets distributed, that makes sense. Say the problem with traditional publishing and literary agents is, you know, after you're gone, how do you how do you hold them accountable? How do you make sure that, you know, that you're getting everything that's due to you? Yeah. Which brings us back to the heir trying to understand whether it was a traditionally published inheritance, how the whole thing works. And I I think uh, in a previous interview with you, which I'll put in the show notes, um, I I was talking to you off off camera and I said to you, I once joked a few years ago, because I've got a normal will and and that is good. As I'm reading your book, I I realized someone who, who may be interested and I just said to my grandson, you know, you'll probably be the only person around who understands anything about the internet and, and how my, my books work or, you know, how, how it would work. But as I've read your book, I've realized you need to have a conversation with someone who will likely be one of your heirs and, and go through it with them. Tell us the three stages we should be looking at. I agree that you should absolutely have a, have that conversation with whoever is going to take over your books because I, I think we don't realize how overwhelming this lifestyle is for someone who has <laughs> never been in it before. <laughs> I mean, you, you think about the, you know, becoming an author for the first time, that's overwhelming. I mean, just all the things you have to learn in terms yeah. of writing a book, editing that book, hiring an editor and a cover designer, learning how to market it. And then you got a website branding. I mean, there's a lot to learn. I think we we almost forget that. See, see, we can do it because we're passionate, but mm. you know, you take a spouse or a child or a grandchild who has no idea, and this may not be their number one passion. That's a challenge. So I think we owe it to them to let them know what's coming because some heirs may say, no, sorry, I don't want that responsibility. But to answer your question in terms of um, the three stages of estate management, you can think about it as a sequential stage. The first stage is the, the planning stage. That's when you figure out what your goals are. You have the conversation with the heir. You meet with an attorney to draft a living will, a will, a trust, those sorts of things. You make your plans known, and that's where you get the legal stuff in order. Then there is the organization phase, which is the biggest phase of estate management. This is all of the stuff that your attorney will never help you with, Mm -hmm. and they will never think to ask you when you're having a conversation. So little things like, okay, what computer do you write on? Is that, does a computer have a passcode? Does it have a password? What is that passcode and password? So your heir can get into the computer. Okay. Now that they've gotten into the computer, where are the writing files? Where's the manuscript? Where's the business files? Where, what programs do you use to format your book? Is that different than the program you use to write the book? I mean, just super simple questions that are obvious to us, but they Mm -hmm. have, heirs would have no idea. Passwords to online accounts. Well, let's start, let's stop there because we'll get to the third part because now you've made many of my listeners and myself think, well, okay, we're in the organizing. It's no point in even hiring a lawyer or a copyright expert till we understand our organizational thought process. If we are creative and haven't put it together. So how would we do that? And and I think we could mention what I found helpful, though I haven't, you know, really dug into it, is your you you give a free um template. Tell us about that and go through the passwords and other things that should be in there. 
Yes. So part of this book, the organization phase is so vast that I, I thought it would be helpful to prepare a organizer. And it, it's not legal advice. It's not anything other than just there's a bunch of fields on this spreadsheet. You fill it out and that helps you get organized. So you putting your passwords on there, putting your writing computer passcodes on there, um, putting the contact information for your attorney, for your accountant, for any author friends that uh, your heir can reach out to, to get help if they, if they run into some trouble with managing your estate. Just pretty much everything I could think of as someone who would want to run an author estate, right? If I was going to run my own estate, what would I need to be able to do that? And I provide that for free as, as part of the book or the author estate handbook. Yes, which is very helpful. But where, okay, so that would help us get organized, but would we keep that in a special place? How, would that go with our will? You know, we, What would we do with that template once we organize? Yes, you, you would keep that in a very safe place that you would let your heir know about. So if that is on a, you know, I, I would probably recommend keeping it on like a USB drive that, and then and then stick that in like a safe with your mm. will is probably the safest way to do it. But especially if it has sensitive information on mm. it, that's probably the best thing to do. But however you do it, just let them know where it is. And and what about the the idea of the one password? I've heard you mention that, you know, a a single manager, password manager. How would that fit in here? Yes. Yeah, so there is something I recommend called a password manager. This is an app that acts like a it, it acts like a safe, but for all your passwords. It's it's software, and all it it basically it will save every password that you have, and the only thing you need to do is remember the master password to get you into the vault. Once you're in the vault, the system will automatically autofill all of your passwords. So you never have to remember mm. another password again, and it will give you stronger, more secure passwords that are harder to hack. And this type of software is useful because it has a feature called emergency access that your heirs can automatically get access into your vault, even if they don't have your password, as long as you set it up properly. Okay. So if you pass away, they can, with one password or one email, they can get access to all your passwords. So if you're going to include your passwords in that template file that I mentioned, mm. you would just make sure you include the password to your yes. master password. Because one thing I'm thinking of, um, which I don't think you cover, is, you know, if you might have heirs in different countries. Like, I've, you know, mm. I've got, I, I live between South Africa and England. And so it's not, you know, if I might say it's in my filing cabinet in England, but I think it would be good if I, I you know, say this is the one password and in, in it are all the other passwords. And actually, I'm skipping a bit before we come to the, the third stage, but I was really taken with your idea of that final letter you write and possibly link it to videos you make. I, I, that, that was quite ra radical for me to think of. Leave, you know, you've. We've seen some movies where the person, you know, the, the the lawyer puts in the the, the video recorder and I am, yeah. you know, I am your grandfather. But um, tell me about your idea of, of the videos, making videos for, for your ears. Yeah, well, the important thing is making things clear for the ears and, and eliminating confusion wherever you can eliminate it. So one of the ways that uh, a lot of authors do this is through a final letter, as you mentioned. And this was popularized by M.L. Buckman. He's a fellow author, estate planning expert. He wrote a fantastic book called Estate Planning for Authors. And he talks about how to develop a letter that basically explains everything and wraps it up in a pretty bow for them. I happen to be a, a visual kind of person. And I also I have a YouTube channel called Author Level Up. And I've learned over the years that video is a phenomenal way to also help people learn what's going on. So what I what I have done is I have recorded a series of videos explaining to my heirs, okay, here is where my files are located. Here is how you can market a book. Here are some of the steps I take to manage my website. Because it, there's some things that are easier to explain in video than by audio. So like, for example, how to how to manage your website. I just mentioned that. Not an easy thing for somebody to manage if they've never managed WordPress before, for example. There's a there's a learning curve to it. 
So being able to just do a quick video, it doesn't have to be an hour long, you know, a, a master class or anything like that, but just even 10 minutes walking through, here's how to log in. Here's how to update the homepage. Things will change over time, but the overtones are similar enough that if they can see it, then mm -hmm. they can understand it. I like that. Just repeat the, the three stages. There's the first stage is... Is the planning stage. And then you get the, the organization stage. And now what's the third stage? The third stage is the management stage. This begins when you pass away and the person that you have chosen to manage your affairs begins managing your affairs per your wishes. So this is, um, you know, this is, this is when you're out of the picture. <laughs> so mm, yeah, yeah. Ho hopefully, hopefully if you've done your planning properly, uh, there won't be any major issues. If there are major issues, then they will be revealed here. Any weaknesses that you had, for example, dying without a will, major mistake. Mm. Mm, right. Mm. Or maybe you didn't give your passwords to your heirs and now they can't get into your accounts. Mm. They can't manage your books. And Amazon begins stockpiling your royalties because you can't <laughs> change the bank account on file. You also mentioned very important the two step authentication. So why are we talking about, you know, telling the heirs about your passwords? Just just remind us about that. Yeah, two-factor authentication is something I, I really want people to know about. That is when you log into an account. And then they send you a one-time passcode or they send you an email with a code and you have to grab that code and put it in in order to access your account. So it is meant to be a security mechanism. And most places they offer it optionally. There's really only a few places that require two-factor, like your bank, for example. And PayPal, it. I've noticed. And started. PayPal. For will instance. also require it, which, you know, it's, it falls into the same category as your yeah. bank. If your heirs can't get that passcode, they cannot get into your account, even if they have your username and password. And I want to let that sink in for a minute because a lot of people, I, I, I know this because I would, this was true for me until last year. A lot of people don't think about what will happen if their phone gets disconnected and they can no longer get those passcodes. Mm -hmm. See, if that happens while you and I are alive, Carol, then you and I can just go to our nearest cell phone store and get a new phone. Mm. Right. And it'll, you know, we'll be out of, we'll, we won't have access to some things for maybe a few hours. But if you pass away and your heirs disconnect your phone without realizing, oh, wait, we need to change the passwords on these different, or we need to change the two factor phone number on these various different accounts, mm. they will be locked out of your accounts forever. So if you are using two factor authentication in any fashion, that represents an existential crisis <laughs> to your estate and you need to figure that out. And I give some solutions on how to do that yeah. and the organizer will help you with that. Major problem you got to think about. Yes, exactly. And and I mean, I'm sure we all go in, you know, this will, this will make a big difference to how we view everything. And as you say, you've only really uh, cottoned onto it by in writing the book and in changing your own your own will. I haven't really had a chance to dig into the author air handbook. What have you really focused on in that book? Yeah, that book is a counterpoint to the author estate handbook. So the author estate handbook is is for authors. And it, I wrote the most comprehensive, nitty gritty, helpful book I could I could muster with mm -hmm. as much information as I could find. On and every yet. step of the estate planning oh, process. It's well, a thank fantastic you. book. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. And so I thought, okay, this is great, but what about the heirs? You know, if I'm an heir, I have no idea where to start. They may, they, you can do everything I talk about in that book in terms of a final letter, um, planning properly, having conversations. I can guarantee you they will still be overwhelmed when it's time to take over everything. And so I thought, okay, what if I wrote a book? that took an overwhelmed heir and held their hand through everything that they need to know once probate is over. The probate process has been settled. The attorneys are pretty much out of the picture. What do you do then? And I've tried to write a book in plain English that explains how an author business works, how copyright works in plain English, super simple to understand. What are some of the things that the author would have been doing and why, mm -hmm. and just try to give them some background and point them in the right direction. It really just is a starting point. It, it 
this was a hard book to write because airs are all, it, it, no air is no air is unique or no air is is the same yeah they're all unique they're right? all come they all come from different perspectives yeah. right so you know you you might have an air that doesn't really know how to use a computer or you could have a whiz, a whiz kid that knows how to do everything they just need to be pointed in the right direction i tried to just give everyone a starting point Mm. In terms of self-publishing, traditional publishing, uh, how to contact a traditional publisher, just anything I could think of that would be helpful. Just, oh, I wish I would have known that. Mm. Or where, where, where would I start? And that's that's what the book does. Great. Um, I'm going to move to social media and our accounts on Facebook and particularly on YouTube because you're such a great YouTuber. Could you tell me, just give me some insight into social media, specifically where you are getting an income from, you know, from something like YouTube? Yeah, social media is uh, tough, especially if it is one of your main sources of income. If, if you have a substantial social media presence, that means you are an influencer. And when you die, the influencing stops in mm -hmm. some respects. There will, there will be no more posts to drive your income, right? And so that's something you have to think about. So you also have to think about the terms of service for social media companies. They specifically state, Facebook, for example, that once you are once you pass away, no one can log in and, and manage your account. Your, your account has to be deleted or it can be memorialized on Facebook, for mm -hmm. example, where they'll, they'll basically freeze your page and it'll basically be like an obituary. And people can pay their respects to you and your heir can manage that, but they can't make posts. They can't, you know, do the same things that you did while you were alive. And this is true on almost every major social media network. When you pass away, your account is pretty much mm. done. Mm. All right. So that's something you have to think about. And so if your heirs want to continue doing social media in your name, they'll have to create a new page in the name of the estate. And so for YouTube, YouTube is a little bit unique. It's one of the exceptions. Mm -hmm. YouTube will allow your channel to keep going and it'll even allow your heirs to continue posting videos to your YouTube channel. I mean, I don't know why they would if you're, <laughs> you know, you're the only person, but you know, they could put together compilation videos or, you know, post a video about your death announcement or, you know, there's all sorts of things they, they might want mm. to do. I, uh, what have you done? I mean, it's quite nice to hear. Your take. The channel will eventually be let go. I mean, I, I'm not going to do anything with it. I, I've, I've given my family the instructions to just sit, sit tight, write out the income and log in every once in a while just to make sure mm -hmm. that everything's okay, that there's no impediments. Change the bank account to make sure that uh, the money goes to the right place. Yeah. I mean, all, all things will eventually come to an end. <laughs> right. But, you know, the amazing thing about YouTube is that I have videos that I did on YouTube 10 years ago that are still still bringing Droid. people to me. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I just got a, a speaking engagement invitation based on a video that I did 10 years ago. Yeah. And now for a word from the sponsor. Today's show is sponsored by the upcoming best-selling book, The Inner Game of Writing, where I have collated the golden nugget wisdom of renowned transformational healers like Brandon Bays, writers like Dr. Joe Vitale of The Secret, and publishers like Mark Allen to help authors and creatives like you tap into your brilliance by upping your inner game in life and writing. Um, to, to bring us back to this, um, this, for many people, quite a thorny topic. You know, they've, they've got to start, probably stop writing their current book and start thinking, or oh, you know, like, how can I leave this in a in a you know in a good place for my ears? Do you have any final pieces of advice that that you would like to leave us with? In fact, could you first tell us the story of Michael Crichton and how he you know how that got complicated, and then give us maybe two takeaways that that so this doesn't happen to us? Yeah, Michael Crichton was was and still is one of the most popular writers in the world. He was the writer of Jurassic Park. He did Westworld. ER was another show that he did. I mean, there's it, his his work is is woven into the fabric of our pop culture. So he he when he passed away, uh, he he passed away of cancer, I believe in 2008. He I, I think he had five wives. His fifth wife was pregnant with his unborn child. 
and he didn't get around to updating his will. So when he passed away, unfortunately, his will had a clause in it that basically said that if you're not listed in the will, you get nothing. Mm -hmm. And so his unborn child and, and his wife, I believe, got nothing from his estate, which was, you know, tens of millions of dollars at that point. And so uh, his fifth wife had to had to end up battling in court with his daughter um, from 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 an earlier relationship to get part of the rights. And it, it costs I don't know how much it costs, but I, I can't I can imagine it would have cost millions of dollars. And his fifth wife was eventually successful in getting part of the estate granted to um, his son due to a loophole in California law. But she spent a whole lot of money, a whole lot of time, a mm. whole lot of energy battling when this could have all been avoided if he had just updated his will in the first place. And so the, the, the big takeaway from that is it's not enough just to have a will. You've also got to keep your will current and it's got to reflect your current wishes. So anytime you have a major life change, like a marriage, a divorce, birth of a child, you move territories, you move states, you want to go back and just make sure that it still reflects. And if if you happen to know, um, you know, that you're going to suffer a death from something like cancer or something where you know it's coming, just make sure that you address that. So th- mm. those are the takeaways. But and then I'll, I'll put a cap on this to say that this topic is not an easy topic to understand. Mm. Um, there's a lot to it, and it can be overwhelming. And what I just like to tell people is you don't have to do it all overnight. You don't Mm -hmm. have to wake up tomorrow and plan your whole estate tomorrow. You can do a little bit at a time and a little bit is better than nothing. And it's never too late. So even if you think, you know, even if you're, you've, you've lived your life and you realize you don't have a will, it's never too late to -hmm. get a will done. If you're, if you're 19 years old and you happen to be listening to this, it's never too early Mm -hmm. to get a will. So just take it a step at a time and you will eventually get there. Yes, thank you Michael for bringing this, you know, into the into the indie self-publishing world and for to give authors a, a you probably help millions of authors at the end of the day actually change change up their their wills and leave a, a what I think you said in your book a, a kinder more loving legacy because to take some of that stress like Michael Crichton's wife had out out of you know a future event which none of us want to admit but we all know is is, is will happen one day so thank yeah. you and all the best with um you know with with your author career which I'm sure is moving ahead in leaps and bounds as always well thank you Carol it's been my pleasure and if anyone <laughs> wants to to check out the books you can find them at authorlevelup.com slash estate handbook. Okay, I'll put that in the show notes, but just repeat that again. Authorlevelup.com slash estate handbook. handbook. Uh, both, of the, both of the books on the page. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks for joining me on today's podcast. Want a free gift to inspire you further on your book writing adventure? My free checklist, five book hook tips to kickstart your book writing journey will help you get clarity on the key essentials to make your book a winner. Download it at writethebookinsideyou.com forward slash free gift. The links are in the show notes. Until next time, a big virtual hug and keep writing.